afternoon. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. Jabi, Ayo, how are you? Hello, Jabi. Morning. Morning. Um, we would like to see your face, though. Yeah, one second. Okay. Yeah, good morning. morning. Good morning. If you could bring your camera down a bit for me. Yeah. Ah, perfect. Super. Austin, good morning. Austin, can you? Austin, are you here? All right. While we're waiting for Austin. Dr. Ngozi, good morning, or is it good afternoon now? Now it's good afternoon. Dr. Ngozi, how are you? I'm, I'm fine, Hello, thank you. Doctor. Good afternoon, I'm fine, thank you. Good afternoon, you're welcome. Thank you. Uh, okay, so <laughs> let me, it's 12 noon, and we're going to start right on time. Let me welcome all the participants and let me welcome our audience and everyone who's watching us from all over the world wherever you're tuning so in for lagos time it is good afternoon for your time it might be good morning or it might be good evening well i greet you all um i'd like to welcome you to this um webinar that has been put together by the tokumbo orimobi foundation and basically on this webinar we shall be speaking to Nigeria in 2020 and vis-a-vis -vis the COVID effect. Now, please, a few ground rules. Um, for everyone who's on the webinar, please may I ask that you mute your microphones, please, especially uh, our participants. Please do mute your microphones. I plead with you, please do, all right? Um, we have our panelists right here with us, and we're going to be discussing the effect of COVID-19 on businesses and industries. And we have some industry experts that will be speaking to it vis-a-vis um, -vis their, um, their industry, and of course, taking drawing an experience from their, from their particular company to the industry, then we'll look at the whole macro issues around Nigeria and what's going to happen um, in, in, this, in this period of COVID. Can I once again um, ask, for Austin. Austin, are you here now? I've accounted for every other panelist. Austin, are you here? Can you say hi? Hello. Austin, are you here? Okay. Um, Loretta, if you can please help me um, find Austin and get him to come on, we would appreciate that. Um, so once again, welcome. So I'm going to do a quick round. Please mute your mics, please. I would always interject to ask that we mute our mics. Please mute your mic. If you're not speaking at any time, please mute your mic. And if I see that um, your mic is on and distorting, I might, I might have to call your name to tell you to mute your mic. But to prevent that, please mute your mic, especially those just joining us now. Please do mute your microphones. Thank you very much. All right, I'm going to go around the room and do a quick introduction so that we'll get to know our panelists. Let me begin with our very own um, Dr. Igozi Onya. Please, um, just a quick introduction of yourself. So I'm um, Ngozi Onya, I'm a pediatrician by training. I'm the, the managing director of Pelo Memorial Hospital. Um, I have a passion for medicine, yeah. <laughs> medicine is my... My, my, reason, my reason for existence. I think that's it. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. And welcome. All right. Um, can I go over to Kemi now? Kemi, please, a quick introduction of yourself. Hi, everyone. <laughs> um, my name is Kemi. I'm coming for KFA Limited. We have a venue on the Lake Access. And I do rentals. I'm happy to be here. Thank you, Kemi. Um, you're welcome. 
Ayodeji Ilesami, can you please do us the honors? Um, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Ayodeji Ilesami, and I am the Chief Financial Officer of Arik Air, and I'm a financial professional, uh, and I'm happy to be on this platform. Thank you. Thank you. Obviously, you will be a financial expert to be the CFO of ARIC. So you're welcome. Ayo Babatsunde, do us the honors. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Ayo Babatsunde, uh, a banker and also a finance, but I'm not an expert like Ayo. So I'm just a banker. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you for your thank you for your modesty. We appreciate it. Do we have Austin right now? Do we now have Austin Ebose? Do we now have him on the call? Okay. Well, I'm, I'm guessing he will join us, but we are not we're not going to do the usual African time or Nigerian time as the case may be. We're just going to kick right at it. So we are here. It is the 29th, 29th day of uh, May. Let me also say, I don't know what it's called now. Is today still Democracy Day? Maybe Happy Democracy Day to all Nigerians or Handover Day, Happy Handover Day um, to all Nigerians. We're celebrating, this is the first year anniversary of, the, of uh, President Wari's second term in office. Can we please mute our mics? If you're listening to us, please mute your mics, please. Just, you will find that button with, that says mute and the mic, just click it. An X will be across your mic and your mic is muted. Thank you, sirs and ma'am. All right, so um, let's get right into it. And I'm going to start because we're talking about COVID and its effect on... Um, I'm, going to, I'm going to start... I'm going to start this. Okay, okay, I got that. Um, please also, before we go in, let me also mention that there's a chat, there's a chat um, option. You can chat to us if you have any questions. Just put it in the chat option. When it's time for the questions, we will take the questions. Also, if for any reason, um, network fluctuation, you get logged off, you can log back in, just write in and be part of the conversation. So yes, it's 20, 29th of May. Um, 2020, we have COVID with us. So, Dr. Ngozi, you're going to have my first question. And my question is simple. Is COVID-19 real? Or is it just something that has come up from somewhere? And um, as some people say in Nigeria, it's just an avenue to make money. Is COVID-19 real? COVID-19 is very real. Very real. I have personally lost a patient. A patient died in my hospital of COVID-19 sometime in, um, at the beginning of May. Two patients that I couldn't manage here and I sent to my isolation center have died that I know. I have personally lost a classmate to COVID-19 who was practicing in the UK. I have personally tested several people here in this hospital who have tested positive. In fact, recently, I, a company came, a company in, as part of their return to work, sent 14 healthy people who they wanted to take off, of, um, off shore. So they wanted to test them to know what their status was before they left. Ten of the fourteen healthy people were positive for COVID, and then as a follow-up, when I asked them questions, many of them said to me, "I treated myself for malaria." <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, um, Loretta, Loretta, you are the you are the host. So you can actually mute people. Loretta, can you help me with muting people that are not speaking? There's a lot of background noise. So just mute all the participants that are not speaking. So the host can do that. Everybody, 
Loretta, can you mute everybody then unmute the panelists? <laughs> Hello, Loretta. Wow. Please, can we mute our microphones, please? Baba Jide Ademolu, can you mute your mic, please? Baba Jide Ademolu, you need to mute your mic. Can Baba Jide hear me? We have a very <laughs> noisy. Yes. Can, no, I'm not like that. Whoever is who is handling the host um, handle? Can you please mute all of this noise for us? As the host, you can actually mute everyone and then unmute those you want to unmute. Okay. So, um, Doctor Ngozi, what I hear from you is that COVID is real. Very real. Very real. Okay. All right. And it's not just a figment of somebody's imagination. No, it is not very real. I mean, like I said, I have seen people die of COVID. I have tested people who have tested positive for COVID. And that, as I was saying, which is important, I said quite a few of them admitted to having treated themselves for COVID in the last two, I mean, for malaria, I'm sorry, in the last two or three weeks, more than mm. once. So they take anti-malaria, they don't feel better, they repeat it. So in other words, they were having the symptoms of COVID, but they did not realize. And as typical of us in Nigeria, they did self-medication and treated themselves for malaria. Okay, just a follow-up question on that. We see videos of the isolation center, and those guys are dancing. So that makes people think, hey, are we sure that these guys just don't have malaria, and you take them to some place, feed them, and give them music to dance? Okay, so let's put COVID in context. Unfortunately, for some reason, mostly driven by social media and ignorance. We all think that a COVID diagnosis is equivalent to a death sentence. It is not. I was having a chat this morning with a lady and I said to her, the chances of dying of COVID is like one in one million. That's the honest truth. It's actually not a, a, a fatal illness, so, so to say. So most people, the one I came with, I'm not talking about 60 out of 100. I'm talking about 99.9 .9 out of 100 will become from COVID. And as I just said to you, I tested 14 healthy people, 10 tested positive. It doesn't mean they didn't have COVID, but COVID isn't often a very fatal illness. But unfortunately, because it came from the West, and when you look at the um, demographics of the West, they have an inverted pyramid where many people are living in and so you have a lot of old people. You also have a lot of old people living together, like in homes. So a, 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 a significant number of people died in a short period of time, mostly because of their age, also because they tended to live together. In Nigeria, our own pyramid is still a regular pyramid. Most of us in Nigeria are young. Therefore, more people who have caught COVID have been healthy young people who have recovered from COVID without mm -hmm. even recognizing that they are It doesn't okay. take that certain people will die of COVID. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Again, housekeeping. Please, can we mute our mics? Bosse Ajayi, can you mute your mic, please? Can we mute our mics? If, you're not, if your mic is not on mute, you can hear all the noise where you are. Can we please mute That's our okay. mics? Baba Jide Ademolu, can you please mute your mic? Ade Takwa, please mute your mic. Um, the, the host, that you, you can actually mute everybody and unmute those that are talking at the per time. As, as the host, okay? Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. All right, quickly, I'm going to go to Ayo Deji Lesami. Ayo, you are CFO of ARIC. Your aircrafts are grounded. COVID has put you guys um, where you're not flying today. Um, so quick question to you. Where do you see, do you think aviation sector in Nigeria can recover uh, even pre, even during or post COVID, do you think you can recover from this? All right, um, thank you very much um, for the question. 
It is um, a known fact today that the aviation sector is one of the most heat industry in the world, as you have most of all our aircraft on ground. Um, as we speak, quite a number of people have returned their least aircraft back to the lessers. Um, passengers are currently not flying. Um, different countries have actually closed their borders, um, both international and even domestic flight in many environments has been shut down. Um, so again, a lot of jobs have also been lost um, in the aviation industry. Um, if you're conversant with the news globally, a lot of staff have been forlocked. Um, why in some sectors, government is supporting them to an extent, and after the support, they will have to still take those hard decisions on their own. So clearly, it's a very, very challenging period for the industry. Um, let me come down to Nigeria based on some statistics. Um, the aviation industry is losing about 20 billion naira every month. Um, this is an industry that supports almost 241,000 um, work uh, workforce um, in the Nigerian industry. That's the direct. We support quite a number of indirect workforces. That's the people that supply to the aviation industry, the catering, the spare part industry, the maintenance industries. Um, we also support the, um, the commerce of the industry, moving people from one place to another in order to support commerce and industry. Those really today are really under threat. So as we speak today, um, the financial capacity of the airline industry globally, not only in Nigeria, to even recover is highly threatened. And when you see some environment, you see government trying to come to the aid of people to say, okay, take this palliatives, take this palliative to help you fairly return back into operation. So going back to your question, yes, is that challenging? But the vision has proven over and over again that they are very, very tough survivors. Uh, we do anticipate that um, there's going to be a reduced number of passengers in the interim mm -hmm. um, because psychologically people will be a bit worried about flying. Um, but we also have to also understand that the uh, Nigerian Civil Aviation Authority are putting quite some measure into place to provide some level of comfort um, for people to fly. We still want to our quotas. It's actually gone because we are going to get into June shortly. Why? Rally at. We are Rally at. looking at it um, cautiously um, to see how the passengers will respond um, to flying. And hopefully, by quarter four, we want to believe that um, changes around the world may necessitate some level of confidence um, in people to fly. But generally, it's a challenging period um, during. Um, and post COVID, but definitely the airline will come out stronger for this. All right, super. Let, uh, let's let's uh, hope that um, the airlines will come back uh, stronger. Please, again, let's mute our mics. Again, please, let's mute our mics. Olufemi um, Owokwetu, please mute your mic. Thank you. God bless. Now, let me go to Kemi. Um, Kemi, I saw. Uh, you, you are into rentals, and so that's more towards event management and all of that. I saw a video recently that is purportedly from Lagos State Government, and it seemed to suggest that um, all the things event centers will have to put in place to be able to um, come back um, to business. So right from people having access to where they're going to wash their hands to sanitizers, one of the ones that really got me thinking was that they said you have to have a COVID-enabled ambulance for an event to hold. I don't know if you have seen that video, but it's how realistic is it that events will come back under this atmosphere that Lagos State is trying to create? Thank you, um, Sam, for that uh, question. I didn't even make that. Um, you didn't talk about the video here. Wow. The video was from the government. It was just um, someone trying to analyze his product. Oh, 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 oh. The video went around all over the world. Um, so, I mean, we, there's, some, there's been some disclaimers that um, have gone out from the association of the venue owners. And um, just to, you know, because there are fears in the industry. People are waiting to know what exactly is going on. Now, because the video said there's going to be ambulance from the Ministry of Health. The question is, how many ambulances do we even have? You know, so that video, like I said, is not from Lagos State. We're waiting on Lagos State to address us on what to do. 
But in terms of the safety measures, we, we've come up, the association has also come up with what we are going to do at our venues, you know. And of course, we're still waiting on Lagos State to advise us. But on, on our own, we've come up with, of course, everybody coming on in to, for events, we would have to wear their masks, we have to wash their hands. But we're, we're not sure of the number of guests that Lagos State is going to allow us to have. But we know from for now that we cannot have the normal 10 people, if you're using a round table, normal 10 people per table. Now it's going to be about five people because you have to ensure the social distance between each person sitting beside you. You know, so for now, like I said, we're waiting on legal state and I'm, I'm hoping that by next week, they're going to address our industry. Mm, I can't hear. I can't hear anything. Okay, sorry, my mic was on mute actually, but I'm back. Thank you, Kemi. Kemi, can you hear me now? Hello, Kemi, can you hear me now? I'm sure you can hear me. Okay, so let me quickly go over to um, Ayo Babatsunde, right? Um, Jabi, you are, you are a banker? Kemi, I sort of lost you a bit. When your network is stable, we'll come back to you, but let me go over to Ayo. Ayo, you're a banker. And um, some people who are listening to us may be worried. They've got their monies in the banks. Uh, we had the lockdown. It affected the banks. We've seen Q1 results from some banks, good Q1 results from many banks. But Q2 is when the effect of this lockdown and everything that COVID has done will actually come into play. So my first simple direct question to you, Ayo, as a banker, can you allay our fears? Should we go and take our monies from the banks and put under our pillows or our banks safe? Okay, thank you very much, Sam. Um, um, I think Q2 is not the real test. It's going to be Q3. Um, so as the banks, let's first talk about the job we do. We are called deposit money banks. So basically, you have some safety where you are sure that your money is in safe hands. So not only is it in safe hands, there's a deposit insurance corporation that at least tries to provide some insurance cover on funds that are put in banks. I think the third point with deposit protection is the level of cash reserve requirement that central bank has um, put in onto the bank. So you find out that if you put a hundred naira deposit with central bank, with a, with a commercial bank, minimum, almost 50% of that money is sitting in CBN. So I think the depositors are protected. Aside with 50% sitting in CBN, there's another 30%, which is liquidity ratio, which is also sitting with CBN. So almost 80% of the funds are assured that you'll come back. Um, but I don't think that's the major thing the banks offer. And I don't think that's the, uh, it's not just custody services for the money. It is how do banks help to galvanize the economy? So, I think it's on the lending side that people have their fears. So the businesses the banks have lent to, how well prepared are they for the COVID? Um, I know there are more questions, but I think answering the question directly, that are the funds protected if they're in banks? I mm. think the monetary policy we run today has already protected more than 85% of everybody's deposits. We have banks that have a cash reserve ratio of almost 100%. So that means all depositors' money is sitting currently with central bank. So I don't think that's our fear today. Okay. Thank you. Um, um, I will definitely come back to the issue on the lending side. But at least um, for everyone listening, um, it's clear to us that our banks, are, our deposits are safe. Um, you know, you have placements with CBN, you have NDIC that's insured the funds, and so our deposit are saved, and, our, and, and to a large extent, to a very large extent, our banks are healthy. I know Austin is here right now. I saw Austin um, on the video. So, Austin, if you're here, can you just um, say hi? Hello. Hello. Good day, everyone. Good day, Austin. Uh, thank you very much, and welcome. 
Austin, can you quickly just introduce yourself before I ask your question? All right, my, my name is, my name, uh, is Austin Osega Ebuse. By the grace of God, I manage Anco Insurance. Okay. Anco Insurance is one of the leading insurance companies in our industry today. And so you're welcome, Austin. Now, Thank Austin, you very from, an, from an insurance perspective, yeah. the morbid fear people have always had about insurance is the ability for insurance to come through yeah. when the need arises. Please, can yeah, we mute our mics? Down. Can we mute our mics? Um, host, can you help me with muting people's mics, please? Thank you. Tunde Pakunle, you need to mute your mic, sir. Thank you, sir. So Austin, yes, as I was saying, um, so there is this morbid fear about people uh, being able to, about insurance companies being able to come through when it is time to pay claims. Now we're in a COVID situation. We can, I can assume that um, perhaps your premium receipts will be affected uh, because people are not making as much money as they ordinary would. And so, so for, for some of our listeners and people who watch this video, the fear might be, should I trust that my insurance company will come through for me if anything happens um, in this period? Especially those who have taken all sorts of personal and work-related um, insurance, and so they need to draw on it now. Can we trust our insurance companies to come through for us? Yeah, but this is the, this is the moment. Uh, COVID-19 has... Um post a lot of negativity in terms of um, other set of the economy, emotionally and otherwise. But I think this is the time insurance needs to come out very strong. Um, I will first of all talk about the, the industry generally, and also give you why there's no reason to fear. Like the banker said, in, in, in insurance, we, that's what we call reinsurance. We have what we call treaties. Some of these things are, are, are done before the insurance itself. It's like you, you have a reserve that you have kept you know, in case of eventuality, that's where we all go to. Reinsurance, um, at the beginning of the year, we have what we call treaty. Those treaties are usually paid, paid on behalf of the client that you are not even seen. In anticipation to say, oh, this year we're going to write about $2 billion for motor vehicle. So those portfolio, you pay down them before you start accepting risk. So such risks are there, and this is the time for you to liquidate on them. That's number one. Then, what there's called re reinsurance. We have reinsurance, we have recession re re as well. So the process is that this risk is some of them are not even domiciled in the country. Some are in dollars mm -hmm. and, and that about. So if you have those risks, there's no fear that, uh, oh, such these things, were, these things will not be done. But you know, generally there's a party by insurance in Nigeria. Even those that the insurance will tell you insurance is not paying you. The rules, once the rules are followed, those things are always uh, here to, uh, to guide us. And let me also tell you that for those this year, um, this month, a lot of people have lost their job. We have a policy in ACO here called loss of employment, which of course is, uh, mm -hmm. we started that policy in Nigeria. And that is what exactly, sorry, I'm not using your platform for adverts, but the truth is that- Don't worry, some, go ahead. Uh, thank you. Some of these people who have uh, this, um, uh, these issues, we are paying them salary. If it's possible for me, I would have been able to display some of these um, uh, because, because of um, uh, policy guidelines. We cannot display those names. I will show you the people that we are paying every month. We pay by 120 million here every month to people who have lost their job in the past because there's, this is the window. And for those who are still going to lose their job, that I involved in this, uh, uh, whatever, they're still going to have their uh, payment done. So insurance has always been, um, this is, the, this is, in fact, this, this COVID-19 is like an advert for insurance uh, company, so to, so to say. Wow. Wow. Okay. Just a follow-up question to that before, I, before I, I, I'll come back to you again, Austin. So on this call, even on the panel, uh, let me use Kemi's um, industry as an example. Kemi is into yeah. events, rentals, and all of that. So today, she manages an event center. Could she have taken a policy with you that in an event of such um, an issue like COVID, or tomorrow it could be something else, Yes. that she could have taken a policy that ensures her against loss of revenue? Do you have such a policy? Business interruption policy. Mm. A lot of Nigeria does not take business interruption policy because they don't believe such a thing will happen. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you, are, you, are, you are aware that um, uh, uh, Wibbly uh, Tennis Open, they've been, showing yes. that, they've been showing for over many years. Not even happened, but this COVID 19, they, they got $120 million. 
mm. because they couldn't conduct Webly done this year. That's business interruption policy. So some of these things are done, mm. but a lot of us have not taken time because we always believe that we have more churches. We do prayers, we do fasting. Some of these things will not will come to pass. <laughs> a lot of us here who are professionals, we don't even have children that make the Christian disruption policy. We have such policies. You know, these are mm. some of the things that happen in the Western world that they put them back in the stead that they were before these issues happen. That's why I said to you, mm. though the COVID-19 is on the negative, emotionally, health-wise, and all that, but for insurance, it's a positive campaign, you know, for people to see and understand that these things are not just being done. Insurance will put you back in the position that you were before the loss. That is the essence of insurance. Even there are some policies wow. that, that, are, that will be of interest so you have never heard of before. I talk to you, not because I'm an insurance person. There is, there is policy called larceny. That if you if your car, if your things are missing, your phone in your car or anywhere it is parked, there's a clause that you have that your phone could be replaced. Even without you going to a phone to insure your whatever. All you need to do is to declare. But because of our usual nature, we do not have those things embedded in that. That's why our insurance industry in this country is not even growing. If you go to Tanzania and all those things, these policies are things people enjoy. If I heard, okay. uh, I heard about uh, the aviation man talking about the less, um, leasing of the aircraft and all whatever. The, it, the, the, the affection of third party liability in aviation, these are some of the things, things that are insured. We insure some okay. aircraft. Passengers liability and disruption liability and all those things. I embedded in all these things. It's a totality insurance mm. in total. Mm. Okay. Wow. Thank you. I know if I, I let you, if I let you continue, you will probably turn this to an insurance uh, conversation. But I'll come please, back to you. My, very hard. <laughs> <laughs> I'll come back to you. Let, let me go uh, back to Doctor. Let me go back to Doctor Gosby. Doctor. Um, so we've spoken about um, COVID, and you've assured us that this is real. It's affecting people. You are seeing the numbers. But let me talk about the business side, the business side of um, of um, of your industry in terms of hospitals and healthcare. Will it be right to say that whilst there is the health challenge, but on a business level, that this period is actually a boom for healthcare industry? Would that be correct? Well, I will say there is an opportunity for healthcare. Mm. Let me put it that way. There's an opportunity for healthcare, but it has affected healthcare because. Our numbers have dwindled significantly. The food falls into the hospital. We had less than a third the number of patients we normally will have in the month of April. In May, it has increased somewhat, but it's not 50% yet. So on that side, mm. it has affected healthcare business in general. So most people will rather stay home than come to the hospital. They only come when they absolutely on the pain of death have to come to the hospital. But then it has created new opportunities, mm. early medicine, which, for example, has always been something we have considered. We've now had to be forced to do telemedicine. So we have seen people remotely. That's healthy. That's number one. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, COVID is a healthcare challenge, and therefore, there are opportunities that have arisen for COVID testing, treating patients with COVID, managing all the fallouts of COVID, including the, um, the anxiety, <laughs> which is probably the biggest. The mental health aspect of COVID is a real challenge. So managing that, people still turn to doctors for mm. that. Too. So yeah, there's an opportunity. In it. Okay, super. All right, thanks. Um, I must so also make a comment. It has driven our costs very high because the cost of doing business, because of the need for PPE. So now I, I'm in the hospital, but I don't have um, my mask on, but my mask is here. I took it off because this yeah. everybody has to mm -hmm. have a mask. And then their hands are tied as every day. And then their gloves. And then we are cleaning tables. I'm sure while this is on, somebody's going to come in to come and wipe the surface of my table. So yes, there are huge costs associated as well. But like I said, it's also an opportunity. Okay, super. So there is cost. Um, you have dwindling um, number of patients, but also there's an opportunity to do other things. But uh, Ayo, uh, Ayo um, I, I I, I'm not an aviation expert, but it's difficult for me to see the opportunities Hello, in aviation guys. right now. It's difficult for me to see okay, opportunities. Okay, once you are down, Joel Legba Bridge, just. Ah, uh, Mr. Joel Legba, can you mute your mic, please? Every other person, mute your mic, please. So sorry about that. I apologize. Thank you. Just mute your mic. Mute your mic. 
um, host, please help me mute mics. And uh, so I was talking to uh, Ayodeji, less me. So I, I can't see the opportunities in aviation, but maybe there are some that we don't know. All right. Um, I don't know whether you can turn your planes to restaurants. I don't know what you're going, what you're going to be able to do. Rather, <laughs> what I heard was that some um, airlines are even letting people go. Yeah. But are there opportunities for aviation, even in the midst of all this? All right. Thank you, Sam, once again. Um, Aviation is a fantastic business, I must tell you. Um, let me mention that just like every other sector, the most affected part of the aviation sector is the commercial flight operation. Yes. But yeah. the COVID and the impact has given a whole lot of opportunity for cargo flights. Mm. All the PPE that have been produced have to be moved from one place to the other. In fact, there have been so much businesses now for cargo operation I mean, in the world. And so people are moving PPEs from China, from Europe, everywhere. Um, there have been opportunities for charter operation. Um, charter operation mm. has improved significantly from the way it used to be because there's no commercial flight operation. Therefore, people have to move to the charter flight operation. Um, even though the significant part is the commercial flight operation, but the challenge with the, significant, with the major part has created opportunities on the other side. It has also given us an opportunity to reevaluate our cost structures in airline. Um, everybody that's mm. concerned with the airline industry will know that most airlines are not profitable. They are very liquid, but not profitable. Um, the reason behind mm. that is very simple. Every day you fly, every day you earn money. So liquidity is not your problem as an airline. But when you look at the books at the end of the year, you realize that not so many airlines are really profitable all over the world. So it's given us an opportunity mm. to reevaluate our cost structure. Wow. Um, from our overhead okay. to our IT, it's also given us opportunity to try quite a number of things. Um, IT, but we are going deeper into IT in order to manage our cost structure now. And so it's, 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 it's an evaluation period for us. It's also helped us to look at other opportunities to see people are not in commercial flight who are only strictly commercial flight operation. Do I want to extend my functions to now more of cargo flights? And do I want to do more of chartered operation? Mm. And we also, even when we then come back to the full flight operation in terms of commercial flight operation, we'll definitely not be carrying the cost structure that we're definitely carrying as we speak today. Quite a number of things will be enhanced by the use of them. It's also a savings um, for the industry. Overall, I think also we will come more strongly um, in the midterm out of this um, current challenge. Yes. Okay, super. So. It's an opportunity for you to look at your cost structure and then you're looking at other aspects of your business. Um, Kemi, so just in the same direction as to what is happening in your industry, right? Um, so if you own an event center, it is an event center. You can use it for A-type events, B-type events, C-type events, but it's still an event center. I, I also don't know too much about your industry, but I can't see what you will use that space for and what you're doing as per your overhead. So how are you guys surviving this? Thank you, Sam, for that question. Um, my industry, event industry, was badly hit. I mean, it's still badly hit as we speak. Um, the last event we had must have been maybe the 20th of March. And um, we have, we call, I mean, over, over cost, we have lots of costs that are just, they're fixed. We have to pay them. Um, mm -hmm. As it is right now, the government has said that, um, Lagos State government said we can't have events more than um, 20 people. Um, mm -hmm. I do, what I do, I have a venue on the Lekki Express, like I said, the KFA event center, and then we do rent out. So we can't go to people's houses to go set up. People are not having events. We've just been having trickle uh, clients call us for 20 chairs, 10 chairs, you know, these are things that we don't even hear before COVID. And for the venue, Something, I mean, there's an opportunity that came up about a week ago. I mean, I'm, I'm particularly excited about it. I looked at the venue and I'm like, what can we do here? What is essential? The government said at this market is essential. Food is essential. So I decided to have a food market. So they're having a food market. It's called going to be called KFA Eli Momo Food Market on the 6th of June. Mm. Sorry, I'm using your to advertise, but... You know, I'm go ahead. Go right ahead. Yeah. So where 
exhibit where it's, not, it's, it's a market where people would come in in the morning from 6 a.m. to 12 noon to sell. We started advertising about six days ago, and so far we have about 50 something sellers. They're so excited. I guess people are ready to sell, they just get out of their homes, and people are willing to come out to buy. So we're going to implement all the safety measures that the government has asked us to do from people coming in, wearing their mask, watching their temperature, they're washing their hands, they're, we're ensuring that we don't have a lot of people, not more than 20 people, buying things that are you know, going from one stand to the other, and ensuring that people that are under the, the, the stand as well, they're not more than two people, just to ensure that mm. safety measure and the people coming to buy to our comfortable, you know, because they're is that oh, are we are you sure that we're not going to have so many people coming at the same time that's an opportunity there you know and then for mm. the rental bit we have trucks that we use for our deliveries i mean that's what we normally use our own vehicles we use for deliveries of our rental items to our clients location now we started doing um logistics we started renting our trucks you know so that's an opportunity wow. there, you know instead of just having the vehicles lying in the in the in the in the in the in the, in the office you know so I'm, I'm seeing lots of opportunities. We never can tell you more opportunities that will come out of this again. At least so far, so good. I'm, I'm very happy. Wow. I, I told somebody recently that we are all in, a, in COVID business school. Um, COVID is teaching us, to, <laughs> is teaching us to, to think broad and to realize that it's not just a question of thinking out of the box, but really there is no box. Okay. That's my, Jab that's my mantra, actually. There's no box. A box doesn't exist. <laughs> At all. No box. <laughs> all right. Let me go to, let me go to Jabi, right? Jabi, I'm going to, um, I'm going to ask, I'm going to ask you about the economy generally. There are people who are listening to us and a bit worried about the things that are happening. Um, yes. Uh, Elise on me is a finance person. Yeah, I know that. He's an accountant. So maybe I'll, I'll seek his opinion too. But you are a banker. Uh, you know the economy, you're a finance person, you've been doing this for years, right? Uh, you've managed the bank, and I know you will still manage another bank. Okay. Recently, we saw GDP for Q1 at 1.8%. We saw CBN MPC come out yesterday, or was it two days ago, to reduce NPR, the monetary policy rate, that's the prime lending rate, by 100 basis points. Um, so I would like you to speak to these two things as it affects the guys who are listening to us. What does this mean for Kemi? What does it mean for Ngozi? What does it mean for Ayo? What does it mean for Austin? What? Uh, people are listening to us. growth for Q1, this is what it is, 1.8%. Meanwhile, Q4 2019, we're 2.2%. CBN has come out to reduce prime lending rate, okay? All manners of palliatives and trying to reflect the economy. We are borrowed from World Bank. We are borrowing again from IMF. We are borrowing from the local sources, um, from banks like you, from PFAs. Government is just on a borrowing spree. What does all of, interpret all of this, make sense of all of this for us? Okay, sir. Um, I wouldn't take it as high a level as you've taken it. I would like to mm. communicate to the man on the street directly. Um, yeah. It's just expected that every day you leave, you grow, um, you grow a notch higher. So every single day, you become one day older. So we expect the GDP just by the velocity, as in the growth or the day passing, that we expect GDP to grow. So what people start asking on why are we expecting GDP to grow, people ask you for what's the inflation rate, what, um, because that tells you prices are moving up, either mm -hmm. by their experiencing now, before we start talking about GDP, is let's talk about the economy. So the economy is not open fully. We have seen an increase in prices of goods and maybe not services yet. But we have seen an increase in prices of goods. If you go to the price of good, why is it increasing? I think there are three things people need to watch out for. So that I'm not just, it's not a lecture, it's just for this time last year, 
The exchange rate had been stable for two years consecutively at 360, 365. And the exchange fixing between the official exchange rate and the undocumented telex transfer exchange rate was very narrow. But right now we've seen a growth of almost 0.1% or 1%. And we're seeing that growth between the windows to be as high as 10%, 20%, dependent on where you are shopping. So first, imported inflation is, impo is good for us to check. There's something else that has happened, right? The demand for something that consumes most of our efforts, which is fuel, PMS, AGO, uh, people say NEPA has been stable, uh, PHCN has been stable, or it hasn't been stable, that's left to where you live in Nigeria. But, but one of the things we've seen is fuel price has come down because the international uh, price of crude has also come down. And we saw the government try to reduce uh, the price of fuel, which mm. gets into transport. Now crude is not a problem. Today, four, like you have now. And when you take the commercial transport workers, so what do you see? The guys are used to load a BRT of 70 passengers. Because of social distancing, you are forcing them to load the BRT with 20 passengers. You are not allowing him to increase the price. Or even if it is going to increase the price, it's just going to be a little increase. It's not commensurate to the load he used to park before. Now, the third is services, which makes a lot for us, which and we call into Technology Hello, Ayo. Hello, Ayo. Can you hear me? Where can we also Hello. Is. That sector looks as if it's been on hold. So when Hello. you come down to... Debbie, can you hear me? Hello, Sam. Yeah. Okay. Just, just hold that yes. thought. And, and if there's anything you can do to your connection to make it stronger, uh, I'd um, appreciate. Now, Dr. Ngozi has to run. Um, yeah. She has a meeting... Um, she has a meeting uh, uh, on the mainland and she's on the island and so um, she has to run but in her place Dr. Abodri who is a consultant gynecologist will come on and then we can continue that conversation so Dr. Ngozi thank you for your time as we welcome Dr. Abodri to join the conversation oh, now she's on, I will leave. Yes, okay. Okay. Please go on. As not Dr. Bodhuri comes in, I'll leave. So is, is, is Okay, all right, fair enough. That's fine. Okay, um, Jabi, back to you. When I was losing you a bit at that, maybe um, the internet connection, but back to you now. Please go ahead. Okay, so what I was trying to extra is what people should actually check, which is the disposable income they have. In the last four, four weeks, we've seen that people have been spending out of savings, mm. not really out of new income. Mm. And how long can you continue to spend out of savings if you are not generating new money? Now, the person that has a supermarket will try and counter my statement and say I've not been spending out of savings. Because what has the person done? They've increased the cost of their goods, right? And it looks as if they've made a higher sale. Mm -hmm. But they've not thought about replacement costs. So by the time they're going yeah. back to replace those goods, they'll find out that they've actually not made a higher sale because the quantity of goods that are being sold is now lower. So let's come back to what 1.8% growth in GDP almost 12.5% in inflation expected, right, will mean to us. 
It means when we're getting to a quarter three, when we believe economic activities have opened. So economic activities are back, maybe shorter time for work. Then employers tell employees that we need to reduce the salary because the sales are not that much. That is when mm. we start feeling the real effect. And the drop in NPR by 100 basis points really is targeted towards lending so that we can boost the economy. But the question about lending is you need to make sure that you are lending to the right sector, the right sector is producing, and people can buy and pay for what they've bought. But that becomes a challenge once there's a hold. So it goes back to everybody trying to check the disposable income I have. Am I going to do an import substitution so that the rise of exchange rate from the parallel market of 365 to almost 460 or on the official market of 360 to now 390, how much of that does that take away from my pocket? Mm. Because that is a direct fact on the disposable income. The second is, if I've done import substitution and imported goods are not affecting me, do I need to realign my taste to say what comes priority, even if it's not imported? What can I deal with in this time of what looks like a, a freeze in the economy? So um, luckily, well, no, most people are not going out. So the frivolous things we spend money on, things like the Ashwebi or the parties and all that, that savings should be plowed into something else. But I think the most important thing we should look at is what the banks are saying and what the people who manage the monetary policy say. Banks are not offering interest waivers. What banks are offering is moratorium yep. and restructuring. I've spoken to a couple of clients who don't understand that. So today, if you owe a bank loan, the bank did not waive the interest. It's the same way if you rented an apartment, your landlord did not waive your rent because of COVID. Once it is one year's, one year's time, the landlord will come back to meet you and tell you to come and pay up for the new rent. So if we understand that, that means we have to generate enough money to cover the cost of borrowing. Mm. Two things you can do to your cost of borrowing. You, you should by now be lengthening when you pay. So if you were paying quarterly before, it's time for you to go there and say, please, can you get, allow me to be paying semi-annual so that I can come back? Or you reduce your mm. interest rate. You go back for a renegotiation of interest rate with your bankers. Right. Please do not be swept away or be, be deceived by that, oh, we're pumping this into the market. That means your loan does not count. Your loan counts. Mm. So your loan and the obligations on the loan continue to count. What is required now is you take a direct action on the loan. Either you extend the cash flows and then you then go for the interest on the loan. Um, CBN has, taken, has shown the way by reducing uh, intervention loans by 400 basis points. So what used to cost 9% before is now 5%. I think it is important that um, businesses and individuals actually go back to meet the lenders to try to renegotiate. Now, it is a renegotiation. Wow. You can make a plea. It might be accepted, but it might not be accepted. But one thing you should not do is sit, fold your hands, and think the bank will understand. Because there's something called the default charges on loan. So if you do not go to your bankers or your lenders to renegotiate or to plead your case and default charges then apply on your exposures, especially for a well-collateralized loan, you will then feel the impact of COVID. Wow. So in, in, in terms of the rate of MPR, all those things are for the macroeconomics. 
for but what's talking about the micro and okay. talking about businesses and households i think that should be the next step that we should take thank you thank you ayo thank you so much ayo thanks for that uh, and um i welcome dr abolorin who has taken over from dr ngozi i'll come back to you but i need to go to uh, Austin, you have some questions from some of our participants, and I'm going to ask you two of those questions. If you can quickly just tackle those questions, Austin. Yeah. The first question is about um, cyber attacks. Yeah. Is there an insurance? Is there an insurance product for cyber attacks for breach of data and for data loss? So, Absolutely. Um, in terms of the um, technology industry, since we all know that technology is the way to go. Mm -hmm. um the second that's one question actually oh, three in one the second okay. question is can an insurance company plead first major not to pay using COVID as first major not to pay claims at this time austin please go ahead <laughs> let me start from claim because that is most important there's nothing yes. like first major not to pay claims if there's any time, if there's any, any if there's a critical time, people need insurance. This is the time. Mm. Mm. So we are not going to run away from our, our whatever. This is the virtuality we are looking for, and this is the opportunity to express ourselves in our profession to say this is what we do to make life better for others. So there's no way we, there's no, not like first major mm. if games are well intended. And even before now, there are there are issues of um, there are clauses in our insurance um, uh, interpretations. That also give room for such palliatives. Even before now, that's what we call S grantia. That even if we are not qualified for claim, there are certain um, uh, principles that will say, oh, this client is done insurance faithfully, but these clauses were not represented in those policies. So we can also accommodate them. Talk less of now that you have issues that are related to COVID 19, if there are business policies. So why not? I just give an example of what happened in WebDB. I'm using that as an universal whatever, but that is very understandable. These are the same things we do here. If we do those things here, why not? We ensure share, we do lots of employment for share staff and also others. So we do, if, if they are not working at the moment and there's business disruption policies that is in place, or third party liability, as the case may be, um, or maybe a renter and some of these things that are not foreseen, why would not we'll come to your, to your rescue? Of course, we will do that. Then on the, um, what the, second, the first question you asked, well, your other question you asked was, why the, the cyber, uh, cyber crime policy? There is, there's a policy on cyber um, crime policies. But not many insurance companies have that right. policy at the moment. Yeah. Most time, most time they close. they're not standing low, most of them are not standing low policies. If you have computer insurance like we do for other companies, they, are, they normally come across this and some of these things are, are there. Uh, because because if your data are stolen, it's a, it's, a, it's a very terrible matter. It's a serious, serious issue that can impact negatively on your on your operations and some of the things that you do. And that can even lead to um, fraud and some of the things. So we have all those policies. Um, that's also go with the bank, like uh, fidelity guarantee, in terms of your money insurance and some of these things. So these are some of the ways to mitigate some of these uh, losses in some of these things that are done by computer. Because no, window now records, most records are now on a more or less in data form, and they're in electronics. So that is yeah. uh, that. So I think I have answered your question. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Austin. You have, uh, Dr. Bolorin. Let me come to you now. Um, when you want to speak, you will need to unmute your mic. Uh, your mic is muted, but you will need to unmute your mic for you to speak for us to hear you. So welcome. Uh, I see you're taking over for um, Dr. Ngozi. Now, um, you are a consultant gynecologist. There might be people listening to us um, who themselves are, have wives that are pregnant or women that are pregnant or have relatives who are pregnant at this time. There is a fear about pregnancy, COVID-19, being COVID positive, being able to deliver. Is the child safe? Can the mother be saved? I read recently that Luth was able to deliver a mother who, had, uh, uh, who was COVID positive. It sounded to me like a big fit. So is there a danger? To a pregnant woman right now amid is there more danger to a pregnant woman amid COVID-19? You need to unmute your mic. Your mic is muted. I don't know what um we can't hear you. You need to unmute your mic. Um 
I don't know what you're using. You need to, um, you, you will see the mic sign. You need to click on it so that it's unmuted. I still can't hear you. Can the host unmute her, please? Host, can you unmute Dr. Ngozi's mic? Can the host unmute Dr. Ngozi's mic? She's unmuted. Hello, Dr. Bullerin, can you talk to me again? I still can't hear. I can still see her mic as muted. I'm trying to unmute her. I, well, Dr. Bullerin, are you using a laptop? If you're using a laptop, can you not? Okay, so if you look at your screen, you will see the video sign. You will see the microphone sign. It has a cross across the microphone sign. Click on it so that the cross goes away. You've done that already. I, I can't understand why you're still muted. Hello. Okay. Yes. Okay. Can you hear me? Super. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Thank you so much for having me. Okay. Um, I'm representing Dr. Onya, like you. So we're talking about pregnant women and uh, what the concerns could be um, in pregnancy and for the unborn child and especially what um, goes into delivering uh, the women, especially in this era. Uh, you did refer to the situation in Lutz, and uh, really it's still a very big challenge, okay? It actually takes a lot to sort out each single woman, okay, that needs to be delivered during this period. And I can tell you that a lot of people uh, in the um, system in Lutz now develop some extra gray hair just trying to get the thing together to deliver. When you push the pictures, everything appears all good. But behind the scene, <laughs> it's a lot mm. of um, work, a lot of coordination that probably was not there previously, you know, to put the thing together. And even when the, the obstetrician is willing, she still needs the cooperation of the anesthetist, the pediatrician, the laboratory, radiologist, everybody needs to work together. And the unfortunate part is that most people are not on the same page. They are not very willing. They are not very excited about the prospect of managing COVID patients. So for pregnant women, um, the risk has not been identified to be higher so far. Um, but you know, pregnancy indeed, I mean, it's a period of up to nine months. So, I mean, COVID itself has not lasted for that long for us to be able to look back to say, oh, this is the impact when someone um, gets the infection in the first trimester, like for example, Zika, we all know about the impact it could have microcephaly yes. and complications. Okay, so we don't have enough time yet to look back to say, oh, COVID could impact pregnancy this way. However, I mean, research has not shown any higher risk. In fact, some have even suggested um, some protection that may be due to the natural um, immune response to accepting the baby in the first instance has been probably even protective because you would expect that the pregnant woman may be more vulnerable to the infection, okay, and that the mm -hmm. impact will be, will be more serious, but that's, that's not what we're seeing. So delivery now, when it comes to delivery, we try to make it as safe as um, possible. Um, all all um, institutions should have a protocol, okay, I mean, to follow, to reduce the risk. And um, some of those... Um, um, some of the things we do will be will include um, minimal changes like, okay, reducing, um, not rupturing the membranes of the woman on time, just leaving it as late as possible. And of course, when you deliver, you remove the baby from the room immediately. So that comes with its own impact. A woman may not be able to hold and cuddle her baby as she should. That initial bonding oh. may be compromised sometimes. Mm. And the type of supports, I mean, they would otherwise have had in labor. Sometimes they may not be able to get that. We have to limit the number of people coming into labor ward. I mean, just to reduce traffic, reduce the risk of infection um, generally. But the risk is not any higher than in the general population. But obviously, it's unveiling. So we need a little more time to be able to look back and uh, do more research to identify if, I mean, there may be other factors that will come up. Ah, thank you, Doctor. So just a, a follow-up question to that. Um, personally, I get the sense, and, and this is where, where I, I've, I've been standing for a while. I now need to know whether I should move from there or continue standing there. I get the sense that with everything COVID, we're all learning. Doctors, yeah. uh, decision makers, everybody, that we are all learning. And so it's more of some things we're doing is probably trial and error. So we try something, it may work, 
we we'll try another one, it may not work, we'll change it. But I get the sense that we are all learning. For you medical practitioners, will it be correct to say that you are also all just learning? Oh, I'm sorry, you're very right. <laughs> we are all learning. I mean, you're very right. I mean, the situation is still unfolding. We've not, yes, it's still unveiling itself. We've not really seen the end of it. And it's not just a little trial. I mean, most of what you do is a lot of I mean, trial and error to see what works to redraw. And um, both in the healthcare mm. and also for government, policies keep changing every day. Okay, you know, for example, we started off mm. trying to take in everybody. The government actually felt they could actually quarantine everybody, but now they're saying they're considering home, uh, mm. home management in Lagos, for example, because we don't have the capacity to do that. And we are turning out the numbers. Yes. I mean, every day, um, about 200, about 250. I mean, and most of the centers are just 100 year, 180 year, 110 year, not in thousands like you would have in other um, settings. So we are all definitely um, learning. But I'm afraid that our ability to learn, at least to really look at our own experience, um, I think is grossly limited in terms of data. Okay, so for, an, uh, for example, I've been a COVID patient and I've been managing an isolation center. So I'm speaking from, from that perspective. I expected more, for example, wow. in terms of research. Okay, I mean, the response we may have as um, um, Africans may be a bit different. You would have, uh, you might have heard that sometimes the fever that would be high on um, the symptom list in terms of how patients would present is not so common mm -hmm. amongst us. So if yes, we don't do yes. our own patients present, then we may miss out some. If we're just looking for fever, fever, and some people cannot taste, cannot, we are downplaying that, or we don't really know exactly how our people are presenting. I mean, it may affect, I mean, the information and management and how well we are able to adapt to everything. So a lot of what we are doing is still relying on what others are doing in their own countries. We can't do much. And even in centers where some of these tests can be done, still limited, still the basic, basic investigations. You know, when they are assessing for inflammatory markers, not many centers can do that, even in government hospitals. You know, they can't do most of these tests. They don't have most of these medications, okay? So it's just the basic things that we have that we're still working with. So I feel in the area of data, I mean, we've done ourselves, we might be doing ourselves a disservice to not, you know, take um, advantage of this opportunity to assess our response to COVID. Okay, thank you. I mean, I, I mean that's very candid. Um, I, I'm, I'm very happy that you've just spoken from a candid um, position. And for me, the right information is more reassuring than trying to paint it as to what is not. That's the way I feel about this thing. So thank you, doctor. All right. Now we're going to begin to bring this to a close and we're going to begin to start to round up. And I'm going to go around again the room as we begin to round up. For those who have questions, you can post it as a chat and I'll ask the question um, for it. Now I'm going to come to you, Kemi. Kemi, you are, you are a chief executive, you run a business, you are in rentals and all of that. Now, there are people listening to us and they are also entrepreneurs or um, people who are just about to start business and all of that or burden entrepreneurs. What would be your advice um, to entrepreneurs generally in this period? What would be your general advice as regards surviving what you have done so far to keep you afloat? and what you hope to go do going forward. Um, thank you, Sam, for that question. Um, during the lockdown, it made me realize that um, my business wasn't essential, you know, and um, food was survival, you know, and health. Those two, food and health, were very mm. important. Mm -hmm. So anyone that wants to go into business now, because really for us that are even in the industry, going back into the business is going to be new. We're going to be starting business afresh. So you that you want to start a new business now, you may, I would advise you want to go into essential, essential sector. <laughs> a sector that could be relevant. I'm, I'm serious. A sector that could be relevant because we never can tell what pandemic is going to happen tomorrow. You know, we're not sure. Because, I mean, like, like I've said, I've never, I've never been down for three months. I mean, it's close to three months now. No income, except the new opportunities that are abiding now. You know, so that's what I'm, I'm going to advise any new entrepreneur. And then for us, we have to just keep thinking out of the box that does not exist. Keep thinking of opportunities that would pick, think opportunities for your business. You know, some, some companies are going to downsize. 
as, as it is right now, I'm not even sure what I'm going to do with my employees because I've not even told them yet we're going to reduce staff. I'm not sure as, as I speak to you because it's even hard getting jobs out there. Mm. It's so hard. Where do I get the funds from when there's no income coming into the, into, there's no revenue coming into the business? And that's why we're having to think of other options. So it's, it's a very tough situation that nobody wow. expected. Very, very tough. It's very tough. Wow. I mean, there's people in wow. my industry right now, they're not doing anything. They are not doing, they're not doing anything. Mm. So it's tough. Okay. Uh, well, I feel you. I feel you. Um, and and I'll say that we should all just keep um, hope alive. There's a question here, and I'm going to take it quickly. Uh, my question, okay, so the question is for you, Dr. Uh, uh, doctor. He says, how profitable is the vaccine suggested by Bill Gates? Because um, I'm aware there are vaccines uh, for polio and meningitis. So he says, how profitable? Well, I don't know if you're into vaccine production. I know you are a consultant gynecologist, but there, is there profit to be made from vaccines so that maybe some of us can start providing, producing vaccines immediately? Oh, okay. Well, well I didn't interpret the question that way. <laughs> okay, I, I thought that um, the person may be saying, because of the reference to polo and meningitis, that, I mean, there is experience now mm -hmm. that if you do give your child vaccines and then you, you reduce the risk of them, I'm um, getting those infections. I thought that was the perspective of yes. the question. Okay, so, but then, so you can take it from um, both. Take, um, it, take it from that perspective as well. <laughs> okay, so for COVID now, I mean, it's still going to be very difficult to say because even for um, your natural immunity, nobody can say for how long the immunity will last. Now, for those who get infected, okay. and then the body um, mounts a, an immune response to the infection, Presently, we cannot say how long you are protected for, okay? So it, all of that is going okay. to be some form of insight. Research is going on that for individuals who have been infected, there are centers where they have them come back um, a few months, two months, check their antibody level, check again in a few months, check again at um, a year and beyond. That's the only way you can assess how long-lasting the effect of the vaccine will be. For COVID, even if you do get a vaccine, I'm not sure anybody will be able to ascertain for how long the protection will be. Okay? So unlike yellow fever vaccine, for example, when you get the yellow fever, because it's been studied over the years, you know it's long. If you've even had the infection once before, you are expected not to, I mean, have it again because of the longer lasting immunity. But it's not so for all viruses. Influenza virus, for example, you keep getting shots, even if you've been vaccinated before, when it comes to the season in some countries, you still get a shot, okay? What the vaccine will help do in most instances is that even if you're exposed to the virus, I mean, you, you sh should not become as ill as you would have been without any vaccine or without any antibody. So, I mean, we still have to observe what will happen with the vaccines. Nobody can ascertain how effective they will be, how long they will last. Okay, and in terms of the um, financial part of it, I do not have any idea, <laughs> but I expect that it should be profitable and maybe the reason some people are advocating for it. I, I really cannot say. Thank okay, you. all right. Thank you, doctor. The next Thank question you. is to Austin. Um, Austin, there's a question here for you. And the question is, can employers take loss of income insurance for their employees? Or can we do a structure where the employer partners with an insurance company, deducts the premium from their salaries and remits to the insurer? Did you get that, Austin? Yes, yes, very well. OK. Yeah, well, yes. Uh, I, it's interesting for, 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 the, for the questioner to, to know that we're already doing that with some banks. Um, we in partnership with uh, two agencies. On the loss of employment, we have two banks under our uh, with us already that we've, uh, we've done this program for. Uh, we've also uh, paid claims, as the case may be, when they about uh, four thousand. One of the banks a little of uh, sometimes in January, December last year. That is it. We do the business of risk, and we've um, we've done that already. So, anybody that wants to come forward to help us help this country in terms of. Uh, Unemployment is, uh, is something that is a human's job. My passion for that thing has 
as a CEO of an insurance company, why that uh, policy is so dear to me. Is that some of us struggle so hard to have our first job and uh, losing it after some time. And the uh, family suffering and going through all those process of uh, things we have gone through before. It's very bad. Moving from one job to another is very good. But when you lose your job, you don't know when you're going to have another one. You already have responsibilities that are bees to be paid, that, uh, that, are, sac that are sacrosanct, that these things are not done. They part on you indirectly, especially for the children. It's also bad. Uh, some of us, does not, we also have policies that scope uh, endowment uh, for children education, that in case um, uh, welfare scheme, in case you, your kids are no longer in school or you don't have uh, that salary payment, it's part of some of the clauses we also have under loss of employment. Then we can take, the, take up the payment of such a school. We're in partnership with some colleges and some universities as well. So it's something that is uh, encouraging that people need to come forward in this country and appreciate insurance very deeply okay. because, yeah. All right, super. So um, clearly, Austin, if I hear you right, what you're saying is that uh, the employer can sit down with an insurance company and structure it. And once you have the buy-in of the employees, you can make the deductions and pay it to the insurance company. But it's Absolutely. for the benefit of the employees. Absolutely. Absolutely. Ah, and okay. also, to, uh, sorry, if I, do I have, still have time? Yeah, just a minute, please. Okay. The, another thing we're also doing that uh, some of these bank credits, People take uh, facilities from the bank, and um, why they why they take that job under the loss of employment scheme, they also lose their job. So part of this credit is also done with us. We have some of these credit uh, uh, persons. Maybe losing your job went after you've taken the credit, even if you are not working for the bank as a, as a customer to the bank. It's part of the insurance okay. we also. All right, thank you, thank you, Austin. All right, yeah. IODG, um, let me come back to you. Um, with with COVID. Um, yes, you've told us that um, insurance, that aviation industry will bounce back. Well, we believe you, and we are, of course, we're hopeful because we need to get around. But there is this sense of a new normal. I, was, I saw recently where it was being touted that the staff, the, the staff of airlines may need PPEs. So your air hostesses and uh, instead of their nice fitted skirts and nice trousers that um, your and, and waistcoats and all of that they wear on the flight is going to be, we're going to probably board flights and see people wearing ppes on the flight my worry is <laughs> you guys are, people are, uh, can you mute your mic please somebody needs to mute their mic okay so my worry um listen to me is this if the staff of the airline are protected you're wearing ppes so for me, that is going to be your client that's going to come and get on that same aircraft. How am I protected? Or how do you plan to protect me? All right, and thanks, and so, uh, so I will just take the next few uh, minutes to address this. First and foremost, the aviation sector is one of the safest in the world um, in terms of the way things work. And um, safety has always been the key of the aviation industry. So first and foremost, I must also mention that um, the NCA are working on guidance um, that will guide that. That's number one. Number two is that there are going to be protection for both the crew and also the passengers. Mm. There are also consideration of um, how do you establish um, physical distancing also within the aircraft. Um, which then means mm. that uh, mm. expect capacity or the load factor which you have on the aircraft will no longer be there. So, for example, a three-seater may have to just take a yes. two in the middle seat open. Um, all the people coming on board, we have to use their face mask. Um, there will be checks, even processes mm -hmm. at the airport where you can even board. Um, there are also some considerations that uh, even within, that may also affect the way we provide service within the aircraft, such as um, provision of certain services in the aircraft may have to stop um, for what we have to just minimize the physical contact or exchange hand-to-hand -hand or contact between the crew and that of the passengers. So those key things are actually going to be there. And also when your aircraft lands at the end of the day, uh, you also ensure that you also um, fumigate them or you ensure that um, they are in good condition to fly the next day. Those are things and measures which have been worked on. They've started prior to the lockdown or the shutdown of the airspace, and they're likely also going to go on. However, there are more challenges. 
Now, the new measures that will be coming out will then create other challenges. Number one is this. You can no longer fill your aircraft 100%. So if you're in a Boeing, you probably fill your Boeing 65%. But you have to still incur the cost of filling of that aircraft. So it's yeah. number one problem. I mean, that the implication is very simple. The cost will still likely have to be shared by the people that have flying. That's number one. Number two is this. Why then do you then balance between the fares that you're going to give to people who are already afraid of flying? Okay, yeah. so are you... Are you going to load them with the cost of flying or you are going to introduce something that will encourage them to fly? So that's the dilemma of the airline sector. And I said, look, anyway, this guy doesn't want to fly in the next year. So should I not give him something to fly? Or should I just say the maths of it? This is the cost of flying now. This is what you should pay. So that's another challenge that the airline is going to be facing. Number three is that technology has been our biggest competitor. Now technology has become a bigger threat um, to some of the services of the airline. Now, before, people would love to fly to hold physical meetings, particularly the business yes. segments. Uh, but today, the like of the technology that you have now, we've tried it in two months and everybody's saying, really, I think, and work has still flown somehow. So you're saying, do I really need to travel physically um, to go and meet this person now to really... Good and, question, and the, yeah. The questions that are actually coming from businesses then you also look at the purchasing power of the people. Quite a number of people have lost their job. The bulk of the people that fly your middle class and above. So that sector is in trouble. I mean, in the economy, mm. um, a lot of them are the businesses are challenged. Quite a number of people are losing their jobs in that particular segment. So you then begin to evaluate what sector of your target market are still going to be available mm. to fly in the midterm. And because of safety, what is saying, I'm not sure our policy now is I don't fly. So these are key challenges that we're still going to be faced by the aviation sector, even as we um, plan after um, the effect of the major heat of COVID. It's just going to be issues we have to really deal with and to see how then do we come out of this. But one thing we're sure is that the aviation sector remains key for commerce and industry within any economy, um, both locally and internationally. Another challenge is also the international economy is also going to be gradually in opening up the international space. So I would done so much to curtail the impact of COVID within my economy. Do I just want people to fly in um, to then come and spread again? Or someone says, if I fly into your economy, I have to quarantine you or put you in isolation for two weeks. You then ask yourself, why do I want to travel to another why do you want to go? for 10 days? It defeats the whole purpose. So there are key considerations, key challenges that are actually going to um, come uh, in the face of the aviation sector as we come back. But as I said, overall, wow. um, we've come through quite a lot of challenges and the aviation um, sector has proven to be a huge uh, survival. In the short term, it might be very challenging, but we're very optimistic that in the long run, we will come out of this challenge. And, uh, come back Super. Thank you very much. Okay, Jabi, let me come to you. Um, and I believe as I come to you, I would have gone around the room. I have one question for Austin. I'll come back to it. But Jabi, let me come to you. Key question is this capital formation. All of these businesses and all the people that are listening to us. Um, so Kemi is running her business. Uh, I can guess that today she's paying salaries and overheads from reserves. Um, same thing for the doctor. I can bet the same thing is happening at ARIC. Um, you know, all over companies are either funding their overheads from their equity position from their reserves, and most times when do those reserves defeat the goods, their equity position and all of that. Is there an opportunity for these companies to recapitalize and be able to raise capital, um, whether equity or debt, to be, you know, even in this time? Okay. Um, I want to be as practical as possible. Um, because when you're setting up a company, people always ask, you need capital. You really don't need capital for running a company day to day mm. because it's possible your suppliers give you credit and mm. also your customers who are buying down pay, pay down to get your goods. So definitely mm. your cash conversion cycle is zero. Yeah. But the essence yeah. of capital is actually for to absorb losses in unforeseen circumstances. So there are two types of capital you see debt capital which is the long term that helps you grow a business and equity capital so i don't think it's the time for anyone to go for equity capital because except you are in a survival mode 
because you'll be selling the company for cheap. Mm. So it's important that if the business was not properly capitalized before, uh, a friend used to tell me that there are two kinds of houses, some built on sand and some built on the rock. So it is the recession, it is the COVID-19, the storm, that tells you what kind of foundation stone you built your business on. Because mm. the capital that was in the business before is what should carry you across this COVID period. <laughs> but if you need to be raising capital now, you are likely going to be diluting your company at a time that is not the best. So if we move away a little bit from equity capital and you only need equity capital in this period, if you were not properly capitalized before, because you'll be selling okay. the equity. So what we should be looking for is partners that will not take the business risk with you. So we're talking about obligatory banking. Right? So once you have such partners, so such a partner will be the banks, but it's important for everyone to know the banks are not kindergartens. They don't operate crashes, uh, especially a commercial bank. So you cannot, if you don't have a stable business, be thinking that the bank will be your best partner as we speak because it's not a crash, right? So it is time for everyone to now start saying, how can I form capital from my business itself? Because mm. the best form of capital is capital that the business generates. So it's time for people to look at things like light, heat, water, telecoms cost to try and take some pushbacks on that. It's time for people to look at, do I make more sales in cash, right? To get cash in, or do I extend credit sales and then have a business write-off in bad debts? So mm. those are the business strategies that people should be looking at right now as we speak. So, because once you advance a credit sale, you might find out that a cash sale is actually better of 100% is better than the credit sale of 150% margin. Mm. Because at 150% margin, there are a lot of people competing when the guy's money comes. Right. This is the time for businesses to start looking for uh, what palliatives are available with government. Mm. So uh, tax rebates are possible because we've heard that FIRS is doing some things LIRS is also doing some things, but it's not a time to run away from regulators and then you then get caught in the web of evasion instead of avoidance. Mm. So another thing is about business process re-engineering. This is the time, like uh, Mr. Ilesomi of ARIC was saying, and you could hear that there's been some strategy going on on how they want to reopen. Every single SME, should be looking at how do I extend my goods and services to the public without using the traditional method. Um, if we were supposed to hold this seminar, we would have rented a hall, we would have had snacks, we would have had all that. But how can you then use this same methodology to take it into your business? How can I just use a phone call with someone sitting at home to make a sale? instead of running light, heat, water, telecoms in the office. So there must be some business re-strategizing. Once that is done, that's the time to go to meet the banks. Because it's not good to go and collect 25%, 20%, 16% money, right? When the business has not been properly reorganized. Mm. So in my view, capital formation, Try and run a little bit away from equity. If your business was well capitalized before, use, use internally generated equity to recap. And then if you are going for debt, do a business re-strategy, a real full strategy, a, a process overhaul to shed off the weight in the business before you then approach the banks. And there are a couple of people who, are not, who give financing that are not banks. But please be careful of taking... Uh, pay their loans, be careful of taking uh, money from sharks, 
uh, who give you interest rates as high as 3% flat per month. I am not sure those businesses, it's in a booming economy, you take 5% flat per month. If not, go back to a proper business, explain your business plan, and let them people finance, become your finance partner for the business. Okay. Right. Wow. That's deep. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ayo. So there's a question here for, uh, there's a question for Austin. So we're talking about on the issue about the job loss insurance. So the question is, we're already in this situation now. Can someone take the insurance and get the benefits immediately? Or do you have a cooling off period? So say if you start now, you don't get the uh, benefit for some time. Or can I just take a job loss insurance today? If I now lose my job, in another two months, I can still get benefits, but subject to the time I've been paying premium. No, yeah. Uh, there's a cooling period. You cannot uh, pay for loss of employment now and begin to enjoy the benefits. Because the loss of employment is an indemnity policy, which has to see for unforeseen circumstances. So if you already know you are going to lose your job, you are paying that. So that does not, I'm not sure it doesn't make any material or economic sense to anyone. So there's always a cooling period. Uh, but when they are in a large group, the cooling period could also be arranged. But, Normally, it's a 12 months um, a window for such, uh, for such time. Uh, but some organizations will have six months, uh, depending on um, the arrangement with the organization, because most of their money comes in block, or they can pay upfront for the period of, of uh, study time. But they are usually a cooling period, not immediate. You cannot start benefits immediately. You were wrote. All right. So thank you very much. Um, so... Before I say the thank yous and, and, and all of that, I'm going to bring on uh, Michael Orimobi, who is, um, who is the one that is, a, that is the birth, that birthed this whole conversation using the Tokumbo Orimobi Foundation. He's, um, the, he's one that runs the Tokumbo Orimobi legal law firm. If you are involved in capital markets, you will know that he's one of the top law firms in our industry. And Michael is on this. Um, so I'm going to bring up Michael to just say a few words, and then we'll come back and, and bring this to a close. Michael? Thank you very much, Sam. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'd like to say a big thank you to our panelists. Um, sorry about my voice. Um, it's not COVID. It's just um, stress of having to work up at night to find objectives. Um, just thank you, everyone, for, for joining in. Um, the webinar is typically one of the things we do in the Tokumbo Movie Foundation. Uh, like Sam said, we are principally a law firm, but we have course on education, mentorship, and pro bono advisory. Doing under our pro bono advisory initiative, seminars, events for people to basically learn about how to run their businesses and also how to do certain things optimally in their businesses. Um, we decided a few months ago to do this webinar on a monthly basis, so the second in the series of webinars we'll be having, and definitely in June also we'll be having another one. Um, thank you very much. I'd like to say a big thank you to uh, Mrs. Adeleke. Um, she's family. Uh, actually, my father is Mrs. Adeleke's godfather. My late father was our godfather, so she's, she's like family. Thank you very much for joining. Uh, Dr. Onia, thank you very much, and Dr. Abodri for stepping in. My very good friend, um, Ayo Lissomi, thank you very much. Um, Jabi is also like a brother to me. Thank you very much for joining in. And my dear friend, um, Sam, thank you for coordinating this also. We're most grateful, and hopefully we'll see all of you next month again. Thank you. All right. Um, so thank you, everyone. Um, thank you, Austin. Um, thank you also. Um, I think that um, Austin is, uh, is the, what, what, what's the right word now? He's a celebrity among us because I see him on TV. Um, so he's the celebrity among the panelists. So thank you, Austin, for, for doing this. And just before we round up, I, I like to say this because um, I think it's important that when people have given their time to, to, to do this, that it's important we do this also in res to reciprocate for them. So if you are here, and you're going to be doing an event after lockdowns, easies, and all of that, you need to be getting in touch with Kemi to make sure that you use our event center. She's on the Lekki 
ask this. She has a, you, you've heard her and you know she knows what she's talking about. Now, if you're looking for a hospital to use, of course, you should be talking to either Dr. Ngozi or Dr. Abudori. Um, it's called Talion Memorial Clinic. You can Google them and find, find them. That's where you should go and you will be safe. All right? And then, of course, after all of this is over and you want to fly, make sure that you fly Arik so that Ayo would have um, income to book on his books, right? <laughs> but Arik, um, actually, personally, that's my preferred. Uh, anyways, I was, I was sad when they stopped flying and I was happy when they came back and I still do fly them. Of course, if you need insurance, you don't have to go any other place but to go to Anchor Insurance and talk to Austin and his colleagues. I like their adverts on TV. And I like the fact that he's the one that leads the advert himself to say that, man, come to us. We know what we're doing. And of course, if you need to talk to, to do your banking business, Ayo Babatunde, he was at, um, in his, in recent past, he was MD of SunTrust Bank, but watch out for him. Uh, a good friend of mine told me that somebody who knows somebody that knows somebody that knows Ayo um, says that something is going to happen. Something is about to happen very soon. All right? And of course, if you need legal advice, so Kumbo, exactly. Kurimobi is the right place to go. <laughs> yeah, uh, clearly, that's the place to go. And then to put all of this together, by the time you need financial advice, we've talked about um, business reengineering, capital raise, capital formation, you better do well, call me. I run Kairos Capital, an investment banking firm, an advisory firm here in Lagos. Thank you all for coming on this webinar. We look forward to doing this again. Till then, please stay safe, observe social distancing, keep you and your loved ones safe. God bless you, and bye for now. Bye. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Very Thank, you Mr. Thank you. Bye. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Bye.